Good morning, everyone. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, this morning, I'm going to give a lecture, which is lecture number 15 for uh, CHM 577. Uh, and today's lecture, I'm going to talk about transition metals. Um, the lecture notes were prepared by Dr. Amalina, and I'm presenting the notes to my students with my own additional um, notes as well. The content of uh, lecture 15 would be transition metals, the electron configuration of transition metals and their metal cations, oxidation states of transition metals, physical properties of transition metals, and chemical properties of transition metals. So to start with, I'm going to introduce to you the first series of transition metals. If you look at periodic table, so this is the periodic table that you already are very familiar with. So this block here, yeah, this block here that I'm touching, these ones, this is called the S. S block because the valence electrons are located on the S orbitals. This block here on the right hand side of the periodic table is called the P block simply because the valence electrons are placed on the P orbitals. And this yellow bit here in the middle, yeah, this yellow in the middle here, they are called. Uh, elements that are placed in the D block, D block, uh, because the outer electrons, the valence shell electrons, are the electrons that are put in the D orbitals. And down here, here, you see, this is called the F block, F, uh, because the lanthanides and the actinides the outer electrons are placed in the F orbitals. So we have S, P, D, and F. So today's lecture, I'm going to focus on the D block, particularly the first series, which is the which are the first uh, 10 uh, metals that are placed in the uh, first row that contains the D block, which is the uh, 3D, the 3D, the sh subshell is uh, 3D. So you, you start with scandium, then titanium, vanadium, chromium, manganese, iron, cobalt, nickel, and copper. Now remember, uh, in English, Fe, which you always normally call ferrum in uh, our Malaysian classroom, is actually iron, yeah, iron, and cuprum, which uh, our Malay Malay speaking students call cuprum, is in English copper. So it's always scandium, titanium, vanadium, chromium, manganese, iron, cobalt, nickel, and copper, as they appear in the periodic table: scandium, titanium. Uh, vanadium, chromium, manganese, iron, cobalt, nickel, copper, and zinc. And you are expected to remember by heart the uh, order of appearance of each of these transition uh, metals, at least the first series. You probably will not be required to remember the second series, which is the yttrium, zirconium, niobium, molybdenum, technetium, ruthenium, rhodium, palladium, silver, and cadmium. You don't need to remember the second series, but everybody doing CHM um, 577 has to remember the order of which the first series transition metals appear. So it's scandin scandium, titanium, vanadium, chromium, manganese, iron, cobalt, nickel, copper, and zinc. So whatever you need to do to remember them, do. Yeah, If you want to make silly song about it or um, 
uh, nonsensical sentences, go ahead. I have my own sentence that helps me to remember. So you make your own sentence as well. So it's scandium, scandium, titanium, vanadium, chromium, manganese, iron, cobalt, nickel, copper, and zinc. Yeah, that's what they look like. Now, transition metals, they occupy the D block of the periodic table, as I explained earlier, and they have D electrons in the valence shell. That means the electrons, the last electrons put in that metal, in those metals, they are put in the D uh, orbital, so they're called D electrons. There are a few characteristics of transition metals and their compounds that um, I'm going to mention five of them here. First, they exhibit more than one oxidation state, as opposed to, for example, sodium. So sodium will never ever have a transit, uh, uh, an oxidation state of plus two or plus three. Sodium will always, always have an, an oxidation state of plus one. Magnesium, always plus two, never one or three. Aluminium, always plus three, never two or three. One, but transition metals are able to exhibit more than one oxidation state. For example, you have, you can have chromium two, which is uh, blue in color. You can have chromium three, which is green in color. And manganese has so many oxidation state, and each one of them are colored differently. Each one of the manganese is colored differently. And talking about colors, the second property of transition metal uh, compounds, they have um, colored compounds. I'm going to talk about this later. Maybe not in this lecture, but uh, in the next le uh, lecture after this. And many of the transition metals, they exhibit catalytic properties. They can become catalysts. And this is what ma that's making so many wonderful discoveries in chemistry where um, scientists uh, or um, um, coordination uh, chemists or organometallic chemists dealing with transition metals, they discover that the compounds possess um, catalytic property. And I also have um, found in my lab a few new complexes that exhibit very, very good catalytic properties. Yep. They also exhibit interesting magnetic properties. You see magnetism, which you do not see in uh, representative metals. When I talk about rep representative metals, they are in the S block or in the P block. These metals that are in the P block, they are representative metals. And these S block metals, the P block metals, they do not possess magnetic properties. They are rarely colored they only have one transition, uh, one oxidation state. And then number five, a unique property or some characteristics of transition metals and their compounds, they form extensive series of compounds known as metal complexes or coordination compounds. So in the next few um, lectures until the end of the semester, we are going to deal with coordination compounds, um, a wonderful branch of chemistry, which um, uh, hold my fascination for the last uh, 30 years, really. Right, I'm going to talk about next the electronic configuration of transition metals and their metal cations. Now, when we talk about how electrons are being arranged in uh, transition metals, you have to know Aufbau principle, yeah? Aufbau principle, um, if you can recall, it's um, 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s, 3p, and then uh, we should go 3d really, but uh, 3d comes after 4s, so it's uh, 3s, 3p, 4s, then 3d and putting in electrons in the 3D um, orbitals make that uh, compound or make that element a transition metal. Now, for example, scandium. Scandium is the first transition metal. Um, it has 21 electrons, yeah? 
So using the alpha principle that I have mentioned earlier is 1s full, so 1s2, then 2s2, that's four electrons already, 2p6, that's um, 10 electrons already, 3s2, 12 electrons, 3p6, 18 electrons, and then 4s2, 20 electrons. 4s2 actually is uh, the location of calcium. And after calcium here, you have scandium. So scandium will, have, will be 4s2,3d1. Yeah? And titanium will be 3d2. Um, vanadium will be 3d3. And so on and so forth. Um, and you also recall that argon has the transition uh, electron configuration of 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, which is a completely filled um, uh, p orbital 2, 8, 8. If you still recall uh, your earlier uh, classes in chemistry, talk about 2.8.8, and you stop there. Now we are venturing beyond that. So argon is... Um, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, up to this blue. So it is always very common that uh, the electron configuration of scandium be written as argon in the uh, square bracket 4s2, 3d1. Otherwise, you are going to have a very, very, very long um, electron configuration to write. So there is a shortcut or there is a shorter way of presenting, just putting argon in the square bracket, which is representing these numbers here. Yep. And then the valence electrons are the 4s2, 3d1. So that is how you write the electron configuration of uh, scandium. So argon, 4s2, 3d1. And uh, if we go along into this, uh, this would be titanium would be 3d2, vanadium would be uh, 3d3, chromium by right should be 3d4, yes. Chromium by right should be 4s2, 3d4, 1, 2, 3, 4. However, for chromium, there is an exception. Um, there is extra stability that can be obtained by any metal that has either half full d orbitals or full d orbitals. So half full d orbitals would be 3d5 and full d orbitals would be 3d10 because each orbital will contain two electrons. So for uh, chromium, it is less stable if it is 4s2, 3d4. Extra stability will be gained if this paired electron of the 4s go away and jump into the 3D making 4s1, 3D5, yeah? 4s1, 3D5 is permitted, whereas 4s2, 3D4 is not permitted. The permission is um, due to um, repulsion, yeah? It is a lot more stable for the arrangement of 4s1, 3D5 uh, rather than 4s2, 3d4. So chromium is an exception. Remember, um, you have, coming back to here, uh, it is um, 4s2, 3d1, titanium is 4s2, 3d2, vanadium is 4s2, 3d3, chromium is not 4s2, it is 4s1, but 3d5, yeah? It cannot be 4s1, 3d4 because you have six electrons to fill. Yeah. So that is about um, chromium, the exception for chromium. Now, if you go next after chromium is manganese, so you have um, 4s2, 3d5. Yeah, here yeah, you have the um, 4s2. Let me make this a little bit bigger. Yeah. 
Here is your chromium with 4S13D5. When you add one more electron, it will have to fill in the S first. So you have 4S23D5. Iron will make uh, 4S23D6. Yep. And the darker blue, um, darker blue uh, orbitals are full with two electrons, whereas the lighter blue orbitals are uh, filled with only one electron. Yeah. Cobalt is 4s2, 3d7. Uh, nickel is 4s2, 3d8. Now copper, it should be 4s2, 3d9, isn't it? Yeah. For copper, it should be, if you follow the flow, it would be 4s2, 3d9. But remember, extra stability can be gained if you have a full d orbital so similar to what happened to chromium the spared electron that you have in your in your 4s in copper will jump and then fill in the empty uh, orbital the half empty orbital of the d making 3d10 because there is extra stability to be gained if you have 3d10 so uh, in this case your copper is another exception where it is 4s1, 3d10, and then adding one more electron to that will give you zinc. So zinc is 4s2, 3d10. Yeah. And uh, this is um, the full electron configuration as it is written, where you have the argon is written fully, whereas in here is the condensed electron configuration where the argon is just written as that, not a full story, yeah? So I hope you now uh, understand how electrons are being filled in each one of your transition metals and the electron configuration of each one of the transition metal. So please um, uh, sing with me again the Transition metals, you still recall? Yeah. I hope you can because I really, really, really um, uh, hope that you have made an effort to remember scandium, titanium, vanadium, chromium, manganese, iron, cobalt, nickel, copper, and zinc. Now, um, how do we write the electron configuration of the cations? You have understood how to write the electron configuration of the neutral metal where you don't have any charges, but when those metals make uh, um, cations, where, which electrons will leave first and how do we write the electron configuration of the metal cation. Now, when an atom of the D block element forms metal cation, the electrons from the 4S orbitals are going to be removed first because the 4S orbitals uh, have a um, higher, it is easier to remove. Yeah, it is easier to remove the 4s uh, electrons compared to the 3d electrons. So the 4s goes away first. Yep. So for example, if we have iron, Fe or ferrum, as you probably would, you know, say it in your head, it is iron really. It has 26 electrons. So argon is 20. Yep. Argon is 20. You need to have uh, sorry, argon is not 20, argon is 18, 288, I'm sorry, pardon me. So argon is 18, so you need to have 8 more electrons to make 26, so you have 4s2, 3d6. Okay, simple, no problem. So when iron becomes a cation with a plus 2 charge or iron 2 plus, it loses 2 electrons, correct? Uh, so instead of 26 electrons, it has 24 electrons. So how do you 
right 24 electrons for the ion cation it is by losing the electron on the s orbital first remember this is the rule it is always the 4s electrons that will go away first yeah so when that goes away what is left is argon 3d6 so argon 3d6 is iron 2 plus now when iron 2 plus further oxidizes to make iron 3 plus there is no other electrons to be removed except the d so it will become argon 3d5 yeah the uh, last electrons to be removed to make fe3 plus will have to be your 3d orbit uh, electrons so instead of 3d6 and in fe2 plus removing one more electrons will give you 3d5 yeah so this is the electron configuration of the the metal in the first series it's metal 2 plus and it's metal 3 plus so scandium is 4s2 3d1 it is always written as um the valence electrons only in in cases like this so valence electrons for um, scandium is 4s2 3d1 it is um metal 2 plus or scandium 2 plus has never ever been um uh discovered so it doesn't happen but metal 3 plus for scandium or scandium 3 plus simply will lose all these valence electrons and only be left with argon argon electron configuration and similarly with the others there yeah? so um so look here the chromium chromium 4s1 3d5 losing two electrons will make you lose the 4s1 first and then one of the 3d5 so it will give you 3d4 losing one more give you 3d3 iron for example uh, iron we've gone through for example cobalt when cobalt becomes cobalt 2 you will lose the 4s2 so you're only left with 3d7 there and then losing one more electrons to make cobalt 3 plus will give you 3d6 so so on and so forth so one thing to remember is you must lose the 4s orbitals first when cations are being formed Right, the existence of D electrons is responsible for several characteristics of transition metals. They often exhibit more than one stable oxidation state, like I was saying earlier. Many of the compounds are colored and they exhibit interesting and important magnetic properties. I'm going to talk about each one of these later. Now, the transition state of uh, transition the oxidation states of transition metals they are uh, the possible ones are listed here we start with scandium titanium vanadium chromium manganese iron cobalt nickel copper and zinc you will see that for example manganese it you can find manganese 2 you can find manganese 3 manganese 4 5 6 and 7 there are so many oxidation states possible for manganese and the most stable oxidation state for each one of these metals are in the red circle yeah so for example scandium will have only scandium and zinc has uh, one oxidation state the others all the all the rest of them they have at least two or three or more oxidation states for example titanium you can have titanium 2 titanium 3 or titanium 4 and the most stable of which is titanium 4 yeah similarly with vanadium you can have vanadium 2 vanadium 3 vanadium 4 or vanadium 5 and the most stable is vanadium 5 so you should be able now to calculate the oxidation state of particular transition metals either in molecule or ion for example what is the oxidation state of manganese in mno2 and in mno4 minus can you do that are you able to do that 
can you uh, stop for a while and calculate what is the oxidation state of manganese in MnO2 and what is the oxidation state of manganese in MnO4 minus? Try that. Are you able to work it out? Okay. So let's see whether you have done it right. So let me reveal the answer. Oops, can I do that? Yeah. The oxidation state of manganese in MnO2 is X. X is something that we do not know. It's a variable. O2 is 2 times minus 2 because each one of the oxygen carries minus 2 charge. It's equal to 0. Why 0? Because this MnO2 does not have any charge. So X plus 2 minus 2, uh, 2 times minus 2 is equal to 0. So X is equal to 4 plus. So in this case, your manganese has an oxidation state of 4 plus. Right? Close up. What about the second one, MnO4 minus? Yeah. Oxidation state of manganese is in MnO4 minus. Manganese, we do not know what is the oxidation state, so we put it as X. There are, oops, excuse me, there are four of oxygen, so four times minus two equal to minus one. Why minus one? Because this whole thing carries with it a charge of minus 1. So you put it as the uh, the other side of the equation. So if you solve this, you're going to find that x is equal to 7 plus. So in permanganate, MnO4 minus, the oxidation state of manganese is 7 plus, whereas in manganese oxide, MnO2, the oxidation state of manganese is 4 plus. So 4 plus and 7 plus. So that is the very, very same calculation that you would be using when you are calculating the oxidation state of any element, including metal, in your um, compound or ion. Great. Next. We are going to talk about the variable oxidation state of transition metals. It is due to the small difference in energy between the d orbitals and the 4s subshell. So when the, the energy difference is small, it is really easy for the electrons to be lost, the next electrons to be gone. It doesn't take much energy for removing another electron, another electron. So that is why it is possible for you to have different transition, different oxidation state for each one of the transition metal because small energy gap between the d orbitals and the 4s subshells. So this will allow varying numbers of electrons to be used in bonding. Yeah, And another one is... Um, uh, uh, talking about colors, yeah. I'm. This is not talking about color yet, but I. W if you see here, manganese two has the color of, um, I don't know, brownish. Manganese uh, six, green. Manganese seven is purple. So if you remember potassium permanganate, that purple color is due to the manganese seven. Vanadium five is yellow. Chromium four is uh, brown or orange. Manganese seven is again the same purple. Yeah. So different oxidation state of the metal will give you different colors usually. Usually, right? And when we talk about colors, you are going to encounter colors later in your. Um, further classes. And the physical properties of transition metals, um, the atomic size. Now, the atomic size decreases at first as you move from scandium to zinc. It does decrease moving from scandium to zinc, but after that, it is remaining, the, the radius of the metals remain fairly constant across the uh, transition metals. Yeah. What about the atomic size? The atomic size um, decreases across the period, as you saw earlier, 
and increases down the column. Obviously, increases down the column because down the column you're moving from three, uh, 3D to 4D to 5D. They are in a different shell. So obviously, the bigger the the bigger the shell, the <clears throat> excuse me, the bigger the radius of the atom. So it does decrease across a period from left to right but increase down the column. There is not a big change to the radii across the row due to the electrons being stable in the outermost, outermost orbital, which is 4s, when you are adding the 3d. But 3d row, roughly the same as the second. The third row, roughly <clears throat> the same as the second, it's not larger, due to the electrons going into 4f, orbital when we go into lanthanides, the F subshell is ineffective at shielding outer electrons from nuclear charge. So the outer electrons are held more tightly by the nucleus and this is called the lanthanide contraction. So have a read about it in any textbook you're going to find more about your lanthanide contraction if you are interested to find it. <coughs> Now, when we talk about ionization energy, the first ionization energy of the transition metal increased relatively little across the period going from left to right. It does increase, but not too much. But zinc increases a little bit because it's a little is once zinc. Zinc is 4s2, 3d10, all full. Yeah. Removing one electron from it will be very difficult because each one of the electrons are already paired up. Yeah, The others, you still have um, electrons unpaired, so it's quite easy to remove. Electronegativity generally increases across the period, but they exhibit, again, a relatively small change in electronegativity as you move from scandium to zinc. Not, not too much difference. What about the chemical properties? So when we talk about the electrode potential, you are going to find that the uh, standard electrode potential of period four or the um, of the 3D transition metals of the M2 plus ions to have this order, titanium, very negative, uh, to reduce it. Uh, uh, to reduce a titanium from titanium 2 plus to become titanium 0, you have to have a very, very negative um, E naught. E naught. That means it is it prefers to be in oxid oxidized condition. So it is very negative it is easy to be oxidized. So if you move from titanium to vanadium, chromium, manganese, iron, cobalt, nickel, copper, two, and zinc, you are going to find that uh, generally you have a decrease in the um, E naught value and the lowest, <clears throat> the, uh, the, the lowest negative value uh, is for copper, um, because zinc really is not a transition metal because a transition metal is defined as um, I have not I have not re I have not um, uh, introduced you to the definition of transition metal so uh, let me do that here so there you go I have put the definition of a transition of transition metals so transition metals are those that have cations with partially filled d orbitals. Therefore, zinc is not a transition metal because zinc two plus, oops, yeah, zinc two plus is three d, three d ten, three d ten, and three d ten is a full d orbitals, not a partially filled d orbitals. So that is why I, I mentioned to you that copper uh, is uh, uh, in the transition metal, copper has the most positive uh, E naught, which is 0 0.34, the most difficult to oxidize, be oxidized. 
So um, among the many transition metals, copper is the uh, most stable. Yeah. The others easy to be oxidized. Yeah. Now the reducing strength of transition metals decreases across the period four of the first row, and all of the period four transition metals except copper are active enough to reduce H plus from aqueous acid to form hydrogen gas. That means all the transition metals are able to um, produce hydrogen from an aqueous acid except for copper. So copper is relatively inactive compared to its other brothers and sisters. Right. Um, now we talk about colors, colors and transition metal. Now, as you can see here, these are pictures of some of the oxides and some of the salts of your transition metal. This is titanium oxide. It is colored white. Sodium chromate, chromate chromium, yeah? Chromium there is yellow. Ferricyanide. It is iron there, it is um, brown. Nickel, two is nitrate, uh, uh, sorry, it's green. Zinc, now have a look here, zinc is white, it's not colored. Because zinc is 3D10, remember zinc 2 plus is 3D10. So the colors come from electrons jumping uh, on uh, through the D orbitals, but if all the D orbitals are full, 3D10, those electrons are not going to be able to jump. So you don't see color for zinc because the electrons stay put. Similarly with scandium oxide, yeah? Also, as you can see, scandium uh, 3 plus, it has argon uh, electron configuration. There is no way for D electrons to be jumping up and down there. So there is no color for scandium. But your vanadyl sulfate is uh, that greenish blue color. Your manganese chloride is pink, light pink. Cobalt chlor uh, chloride is um, maroon, dark red. Copper 2 sulfate is obviously blue. You've seen uh, copper sulfate solution in the lab before. It is blue. So this is the wonderful, wonderful colors of transition metals. And I'm going to explain to you about jumping D electrons that will give rise to uh, these wonderful colors. Maybe not in this lecture, maybe in the uh, coming few lectures, right? So why color? If a chemical is colored, it means that it has absorbed light. It is possible. It, the possibility of it to absorb light is big. The color is the transmitted portion of light that is not absorbed by that material. So for example, this is the material. Yeah, My hand is the material, for example. Um, when light um, hit my hand, some of the uh, some of the portion of that light is absorbed by my hand and what you see is the portion of the light that is transmitted or not absorbed by my hand. So that's why. So this red color, that means this red color is not uh, absorbed. It's the portion of white light that is not absorbed by the material of my uh, to do, yeah. To absorb light energy, an atom must have an empty electronic orbital that is just a little higher in energy than the field d orbital. So you have um, the d orbitals. When we talk about um, degeneration of d orbitals, this is going to be a lot more clearer. The d orbitals of transition elements generally meet this requirement that it has empty electronic orbitals a little bit higher in energy than the full d orbital don't worry about it if you don't understand it yet so uh, the color is due to the um uh electrons being 
uh, absorbing visible wavelength of light and moving to higher energy d orbital, giving striking colors, except for titanium, scandium, and zinc that we saw just now. Magnetism, uh, this is another one we're going to talk about. Some of the coordination compounds or the transition metal complexes are paramagnetic, which means they are attracted to magnetic field. Uh, some of them are diamagnetic. They are unaffected by the magnetic field. So why and how? Uh, this is going to be revealed in my next few lectures. Don't worry. And that's it. I think uh, this is the uh, introduction to a coordination compound that is going to hopefully leave you feeling curious about the colors, about the magnetism of transition metal. So that's it, girls and boys. Um, I'm going to end my lecture 15 here, and I'm going to see you in lecture 16. Okay, goodbye, take care, and keep safe. Assalamu alaikum.